This is Sharon doing a visual radio show in my earphones. They're so wonderful. They feel like mega earmuffs. When we went east, we drove down the east coast and it was just at the moment when the leaves were turning. So we saw colors, thought about colors. I had colorful connections with friends that we care about, that are part of my life and other friends and family that are part of Bruce's life. And this brought to mind the idea of sharing with you from my novel in progress called Colored Edges, where I write about things under the chapter heading of various colors and try to evoke from my own consciousness and from material and all the ways that fiction gets written um, in, in the, the cloak of that color. This one, this chapter is called Vermilion. So Vermilion's a kind of orange. You could say terracotta is a kind of orange too, but a very different kind. Earthy. Vermilion's more kind of glowing. Not quite day glow, but bright. So join me as I take you to uh, to get a latte. Cabs were like sharks, cruising the streets with chrome grills like open teeth. Even the most ordinary scene was surreal. On the day the power went out in San Francisco, nothing ended up normal. That day was an epiphany for Marigold. She realized that the city had succeeded in intimidating her for decades, but that it was actually no more than a toy on a leash, plugged into one enormous outlet. That day, four simple humans had caused simple human error by neglecting to unhook their grounding rod of copper before switching the power back on. So all of the juice destined to keep the computers, lights, etc. flowing into San Francisco poured into the ground instead with a giant whoosh. And somewhere else on this sensitive planet at some faraway geothermal acupressure point, a giant owie happened. And either an earthquake or volcano or revolution, the result. Only no one was out there to connect the dots. The cafe was crowded and overly hot. Frosty windows sweated their sugary tears all the way down the panes. Marigold and Ephraim had their heads bent close together, huddling, proofreading his psychology treatise. You're the only one I trust to read this, muttered Ephraim. You didn't just write it for me, I hope. Marigold snapped impatiently. Her knees ached. She wanted to be back home at her own desk, writing her own ideas. Instead, once again, here she was supporting a man and his expression, as though central casting had tapped her for the role. Oh, I know it's good, F. Why do you need me to read it anyway? I'm not a therapist. Because you have the ear for it, kid, and you're not a bull bleeper. And besides, you're so darn cute. A hand slipped under Marigold's skirt under the table. Just a little. Um, uh, no, not just now. I never mix pleasure with cappuccino. Ah, so you admit that... I admit nothing. Our deal's still a deal. Platonic is better for us. We're such a brother and sister act. Why ruin it? We know too much. I see right through you. You're transparent, man. Okay, that's enough of that. In two hours, I've got to hand this in, and I can still run home and change stuff if you find anything. She read a page. The paper was called Supporting the Soul, The Four Pillars, A Theory of Personality. And it was complex, and she read it, and she brought her head up for air after a few paragraphs. Well, it said things like, The needs which construct the four pillars of mind in a human being are belonging, empowerment, meaningfulness, and higher purpose. These needs are beyond the physical level of need, what might be called spiritual. 
In a person who is able to maintain a healthy balance, a way has been found to actualize and manifest fulfillment of these four needs. In a disturbed, unstable, or imbalanced person, an inner or outer force has thwarted one or more of these fulfillments of need, and the spiritually deprived personality struggles to compensate for its dwarf state or loss. I like it. Four pillars sound stable, like a table. Not exactly the under-the-table countercultural Kabbalistic mystical stuff that you're famous for. In very small circles, well, it all gets mushed together by the great blender, ultimately. Ephraim made a spiritual, a spiral motion at his forehead before it feeds the worms. Depressing. Hey, could you just read the thing to me out loud and then I can hear if it flows? You mean here, out loud, in front of all these kids? What if somebody hears me and actually learns something? We'll have to take that chance. Will you read it? Okay, if you'll agree to go to the Children of Holocaust Survivors Hanukkah party with me next week. That sounds like loads of fun. You would say that. You work so hard not to connect with your roots. That's because other people worked so hard to cut them off. Okay, I'll go for a little while anyway. Here. Ephraim shoved at the computer printout in front of Marigold and said, and then I'll surrender you to your steam milk and examiner, unless you have a sore throat or something. No, I'm fine. Marigold was oddly comforted by Ephraim's concern. The four pillars, a psychological theory of personality, began Marigold with a fake serious tone. She soon changed that into a martial voice as she was swept into the ideas. Belonging was one pillar, empowerment was another, meaningfulness was the third, self-esteem the fourth. Yeah, she thought to herself between words where F couldn't hear. If I had all of those, I'd be set. And a little less ambivalence, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. But she couldn't quite decide about that one. She read on and behind her eyes, the old image form the one that had tracked her daydreams and nightmares for years intermittently. Marigold in a Hawaiian muumuu, pregnant again, with five or six laughing children pulling at her skirts and a muscular adoring mate walking toward her on the beach. Versus Marigold at the podium giving a talk on the meaning of life and how to achieve peace in the world with an adoring audience applauding and one handsome listener in the first row sending her infinite support one image moved over the other one until the outlines fuzzed out into fog. Belonging, what did you just say? Where do you go when you read anyway? I just wondered if you thought one thing was more important than the other, like belonging comes before self-esteem, for kids, say, or the opposite. Marigold felt her oracle hat descending onto her forehead like a wired helmet in a Star Trek movie or a dryer hood in a beauty salon. You don't need to impose a hierarchy on the four pillars. That would be like favoring one table leg over the other and you end up all rickety. They all count. Just like at this table, it all depends on where you sit. You're right, you're right, you're right. Great, now let me take it and I can head over to class. Ephraim pulled on his gloves and shoved his wool cap down on the wavy brown hair that looked so casually tousled. Marigold always wanted to run her hands through it. She knew for a fact that he got it styled, but she didn't say anything. She knew that guys didn't like to think of women thinking of them in front of the mirror with a hairdryer. That much at least she knew about guys. Sipping her steamed milk put her in a reverie. On the way to her car and all the way home across the big orange bridge, she saw a painted landscape rise up behind the wintergreen marine headlands that had nothing to do with the vast Pacific Ocean spilling out on one side of her and the tiny snow globe skyline of San Francisco on the other. It was a desert with barren hills and a piercing sunset sky, seeding her mind, wanting to be fertilized and carried to birth on canvas. Peeling away her scarf and hat and gloves, Marigold felt a rare sense of contentment. It was as though she was actually letting herself off the hook for a while, taking a vacation from being on her own case. 
Saving the world can wait until next week, she thought. I'm going for a walk on Agate Beach. The next Sunday, Marigold went for another walk, only this time it wasn't on Agate Beach up in Bolinas. It was a walk in the Marin Headlands just past the Golden Gate Bridge, a dizzying vista looking down on the span. That morning, the rabbi at Kol Haim had said to the assembled singles congregation that you can't have peace until you confront your own fears. Yes, she thought, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Afterward, Marigold approached the rabbi at the Kiddush gathering. Youngish, verging on middle age, his face shone with the eager look of an inspired schoolboy. Swallowing her feelings of intimidation, she told the rabbi that she was wrestling in her writing with the search for peace. Well, you've got the issues, he responded. Give me a call when you've got it figured out. There was not a hint of sarcasm in what he said, only the respect due a fellow seeker. Now that's a rabbi, she thought, leaving the spiritual oasis in suburban Tiburon, her head adrift in an inner fog that mirrored a misty afternoon. If it was this way in typically sunny Tiburon, she wondered what it would be like in the headlands, and she then decided to find out. She drove over to the GGNRA, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, where it began just above the Golden Gate Bridge. She pulled over into a parking area and stared at the surreal bridge just below. Coast Miwok Indian ancestors would have said that the creamy fog that billowed in from the sundown sea to slither down the coastal hills was Coyote Man smoking tobacco. Tobacco. It got such a bad rap mused Marigold as she stood gaping as the huge and solid north tower of the bridge that soared upward suddenly completely disappeared into opaque white fog. It was comforting to wrestle with ideas, took her out of her head for a while. Tobacco was a power plant, calming and centering. It was not inhaled in Indian ceremonies, a power substance like the Stetson red wine in the Kiddush blessing. Each of them an arid, aid to prayer at one end of the spectrum, and addictive or even lethal at the other. She walked along the side of the road at the top of a cliff on the edge of the world. She watched a bee travel between two tall star thistles against a background of solid white that yesterday and tomorrow was and would be again, crystalline air and reaching ocean. Now it was nothing. Stetson red wine, swinging all the way from power prayers to getting drunk. She remembered her affair with the handsome improvisational actor who had become an alcoholic in the years between the time of her exuberant crush on him or his stage persona, and years later when they ran into each other at a Mitchell Brothers party. Only after they were involved did she realize that there were two of him, her own personal Jekyll and Hyde. She could see from this great distance how he'd used the sauce to drown the pain, explaining to her it was quick. She'd done some research. She'd wanted to help him, heal him, be his savior. She read about the unbearable emotional suffering that a tyrannical superego can inflict on the psyche, a suffering that could somatize into sickening, dull headaches sending its victim running to self-medicate as fast as possible to stem the inner beating she went running with her findings to her actor, excited that maybe she'd located the key to his healing. Unrepentant Burton McCall, with his giant bottle of vodka, the only thing in his freezer. He didn't want to hear about it. He wanted nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous and denied adamantly that he had a problem. He'd wanted her to move in with him. Once he even said, as though teeth were being pulled and arms twisted, all right, I'll marry you. She'd loved him, the sober him, that is. The drunk Burton was nasty and erratic, edging to violence. Then she started to experience her own headache, somatized psychic pain over their impossible situation. She got drunk one night alone, partly to drown the headache and partly to go where Burton went. She wrote to him, snail mail, this was before the internet, now I know what it feels like and why you do it. But she couldn't live with his addiction and self-lies, and soon they parted. 
Marigold meandered along, humming a corny song into the chill white wisps around her and hearing the words in her head, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. If peace on earth needed to begin with her, then the big old planet was in some deep doo-doo. Her shoulders ached with her own constant inner war, never over, never a truce. Peace of mind would be such a relief, peace of heart, a greater blessing. So the rabbi this morning said you have to confront your fears first. What were her fears anyway? Today, reaching her special sitting rock that usually provided incredible ocean and bay views, Marigold didn't feel afraid. This place on the edge of space felt paradoxically safe. You could see nothing. It was a total whiteout, as though her hill were the only hill in the world and she the only person. She recalled another old boyfriend now plying the Pacific as a sea captain who said when the world ended at the bow of the freighter in a solid sheet of fog, you couldn't see anything. So what was there to be afraid of? From an eagle's view was a serene and muted landscape today with a small, bright, confused collage of a woman in one corner of it, a roiling human stew pot of confusion and dreams screens that held her in and screws that kept her down and sparkling merry-go-round rides that buoyed her spirit and kept her straining for the brass ring just out of reach. When she asked herself what her fears were, she couldn't see a thing there either. Maybe she could get a handle on them if she could read them into her dreams or read her dreams. She decided she would keep a dream log, a pen and pad and flashlight by her bed. She was a tiny solitary figure standing in a swirl of disappearing froth on the edge of a vanished sea. And she had an idea. I'm glad that I could share these words with you, these words that have been waiting to be born as a book or part of a book for a long, long time. They have come with me through many days through many colors, through many decades, actually. Even some of them survived a fire that happened to not burn them because they were in a metal filing cabinet. Highly recommended in case your place burns down. Thank you for listening. Um, what you just heard is a chapter called Vermilion from a book called Colored Edges by Sharon Skolnick Magnoli. That's me.